Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. I'd just like to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the second event in the Opening Doors, Embracing Diversity in National Security Series. My name is Seamus Daniels. Uh, I'm an Associate Director and Associate Fellow for Defense Budget Analysis in the International Security Program at CSIS. The Opening Doors Series is part of the International Security Security Program's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Action Plan. We'll be hosting quarterly events where members of the ISP Young Professional staff will discuss mentoring, networking, their career paths, and education backgrounds, and how DEI issues have impacted them. Today, I'm having a conversation with my colleague, Sean Shake. Sean's a program manager and research associate with the Missile Defense Project, where he focuses on missile proliferation, air defense, and non-state actors. Prior to joining CSIS, he interned at the U.S. Defense Department and at the Syria Institute. Sean received his bachelor's degree in international relations and Arabic from Tufts University. Uh, we're going to start out with about 20 to 30 minutes of uh, conversation between Sean and I. Uh, but if you have any questions uh, for after that period, you can submit them via Zoom at the bottom of at the button at the bottom of the page. Sean, thanks for joining me. It's nice to have you here. It's been a while since we've actually seen each other in person, um, but it's great to have you this morning. It's good to be here. Thanks, Seamus. I just wanted to uh, start our conversation by asking you how you ended up at this point in your career. Um, you know, uh, for me as an outsider, the missile defense field is a very specific area of research and it can be very technical at times. Um, is it something that, you know, you've always been passionate about or is it something that you thought you sort of found yourself in? So, yeah, you're right. Missile defense is pretty specific. It's, it's not something that I was initially interested in. Um, I was always interested in public policy more generally. Um, just the process of turning ideas into law I thought was fascinating. Um, and of course, it's a field where you can do um, a lot of good. Um, uh, that's, that's the hope. <laughs> so going into college, I, I wanted to study international relations um, and I kind of pretty much stuck with it. Uh, I thought I'd go into law school or maybe find my way into government somehow. I uh, wasn't exactly sure uh, the, the exact path, but I, I thought IR as a field would be a lot of fun. Um, now, the way that I got into missile defense was, was pretty accidental. I, uh, had randomly applied to a Department of Defense internship the summer between my, I think it was my sophomore and junior year. Um, I didn't have actually that many, that much security studies background, um, whether academically or outside from previous internships. Um, but I worked pretty hard on my resume, my cover letter, all stuff that we can talk about later. Um, and uh, I, was, I got accepted somehow. Um, was able to work with the, uh, my incredible advisor, Bess Dopkin, um, and she had me working on a long-term, or at least for me, long-term as a summer uh, research project focused on missile defense. Um, I thought it was just a really cool field. Uh, you have both a sort of academic aspect of it because it's tied in with nuclear issues, um, with arms control, uh, sort of these like pretty strategic, uh, grand strategy kind of level stuff. But then you also have the practical day-to-day -day, um, activities where, you know, unfortunately, there, there are missiles being lobbed. Um, pretty frequently nowadays, and air defenses and missile defenses are being used. Um, so you have that uh, practical aspect of it as well. So I, I've been enjoying my time focused on this field um, for now past few years, um, and you know, hopefully for for some, for some more time to come. I feel like there's always that that hook that really pulls IR students into the security studies world. And you know, as, as someone who works on defense budget analysis, I don't think there are too many uh, people out there who say, you know, I want to grow up and be a defense budget analyst. Um, so I feel like there's always that avenue that IR students come into uh, come into this world. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about your day to day at CSIS and what you know you typically do for the missile defense project? Sure. So just generally, I mean, uh, talking about think tanks more broadly, people might be familiar with, with uh, this kind of phrasing, but think tanks are sort of seen as the nexus between academia and journalism. So we have, of course, 
the, the academic related reports where we're, we're doing research for, for months longer um, and, and packaging it in sort of uh, a way that policymakers and others uh, can, can read um, and, and understand pretty, pretty easily. Um, but honestly, there, there's a ton that goes into this, this role. Uh, you're a writer, you're an analyst, you're an editor, a designer, um, event planner, of course. You, we, we were doing a ton of events at CSIS and now we're doing it virtual. Um, so basically there, there's a ton that goes into it. Uh, in terms of my role, I, as you mentioned in, in my intro, I'm dual hatted as a research associate and program manager. And so that basically means that I work both sides of the house, the, the research and admin side. Um, so on the research side, uh, I will work on topics of missile proliferation primarily, and also air defense, uh, non-state actors. And, and I, there's also a few opportunities to work on, on nuclear issues. Um, now the admin side, that's gonna be the, the same basically at CSIS, at other think tanks, at other organizations. Um, you're keeping track of budgets on ongoing projects, um, working event logistics, uh, what have you. Um, so that that's that will be bucketed into the admin side, and that that probably takes up a decent amount of my time, probably sixty to seventy percent of my time. Um, and I know that comes out as, as a surprise to some folks who are interested in research roles, um, but it is it is really really important um, to just maintain the organization, may, make sure that everything is flowing well. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought up kind of both aspects of your role, because I think a lot of people think of think tanks um, as a space where it's exclusively research. Um, but for a lot of young professionals coming into the field, coming into this sector, you know, there is a lot of administrative work that you have to do um, to actually make sure that your program is running, to make sure that things are getting published. Um, et cetera. So it is, I, I know we'll talk about this a little bit more when we're talking about career paths, but that is an important part uh, of the role for any young staffer at a think tank. Um, but on the research side of things, I really enjoy your analysis specifically because you write on the intersection of you know, broader policy making, broader defense strategy, uh, and the use of missiles. And I was wondering, can you speak to how the use and proliferation of missiles and missile defense systems and missile defense technologies affect the geopolitical environment, you know, both at a, at a regional level, um, but also at that broader global geopolitical level? Yeah, so that, that's, that's a big question. Um, Highly recommend folks to you know look up missile defense projects, CSIS. Uh, we have some good reports, or at least I believe we do. Um, in short, a, a lot of my work focuses on missile proliferation, um, and what I am find, finding isn't too original, but it's, it's an important point to you know hit on. And it's that you know places that weren't vulnerable are vulnerable today. Um, Non-state actors, in particular, these are some of the topics that I look at, uh, whether it's the Houthis in Yemen. Um, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, Iraqi militias, otherwise not just limited to the Middle East, of course. Um, they, they have pretty impressive capabilities nowadays. Um, and so this is uh, uh, something that can put targets uh, at risk, whether they're military, political, um, economic. Um, and it's something that we're gonna have to contend to as these uh, systems proliferate, as they spread um, through, throughout the world, really. Yeah, and that's something before actually reading your team's work and analysis, I didn't really think of how missiles and then missile defense systems in response to those missiles actually impact kind of that broader geopolitical level. Um, you know, especially when we're talking about the conflict in Yemen and the Houthis uh, use of missiles uh, against Saudi Arabia and how that's pulled global actors like the United States onto that stage. Um, but shifting gears here, I, I wanted to come back to the theme of the Opening Door series uh, and the impact of DEI issues on national security career paths. Um, as we know, the national security community is, is heavily white male dominated. And there's been solid progress recently in raising awareness and diversifying the NATSEC workforce, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, can you talk about your experience um, as a Muslim American Pakistani in this field? Um, and how have you navigated your culture at the office and in the national security community more broadly? Sure, so I sort of see two questions, two parts of that question, right? There's the uh, sort of cultural American Pakistani part and then there's the religious. So uh, in full disclosure, with regards to the former uh, being Pakistani, I'm third generation American. 
So I don't feel that too often. Um, I've been very fortunate, very privileged to not face racial discrimination at work um, or otherwise. Um, so so that, that, that hasn't had too much of an impact for me, at least. Um, I know others have, have very different experiences, though. Um, now, religiously, though, being Muslim does come with certain uh, requirements, certain practices that will affect my time at work. Um, for example, not, not to give too much of like an Islam 101, but over Ramadan, we do fast for a month, uh, not eating or drinking while the sun is up. Um, and that does make working regular hours difficult. So uh, I've been, again, very fortunate, very privileged to talk to my boss, Tom Carrico, who's been understanding and I was able to go to work early, leave work early uh, in order to maintain the same kind of energy level that I have uh, normally and have the same kind of output. So that's been great. Um, another requirement for Muslims is to pray five times a day. Um, two of those prayers are typically during uh, work hours. So uh, I've mentioned this to my colleagues so that way they, don't, they know that I'm not just flipping out for extended breaks or something. Um, just having that kind of communication, I think, is, is important when you do have those religious obligations. So as long as everyone is on the same page, um, it, it really does seem to be fine. Uh, now, when you're talking about being Muslim in the national security space more broadly, um, there, there will be some issues. There, you will have some difficulties. Uh, just to give an example, like uh, I, I remember pretty well the first time um, an army recruiter had come to my high school to speak to my history class. Um, he was talking about his experience in Iraq uh, and talking with Muslim communities uh, in, in, in his sector um, and how difficult that would be, especially given, according to him, uh, a pillar of Islam was the destruction of Israel. And so uh, that, you know, of course, is not a pillar of Islam. Um, and I had mentioned that, I raised, raised my hand, politely tried to explain like, uh, thank you for the presentation. This is not something that is incorrect though. Um, speaking as Muslim here, here's the actual pillars of Islam. Um, we had a little bit of an awkward conversation in the middle of the class. And so uh, I don't think I convinced him. My classmate seems a little confused, but it, 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 this is something that will come up as a Muslim working within these spaces. Um, it's not, you know, it's not fun, uh, uh, but it, it's just something to be prepared for. Um, it's a reality that we that we will face. I feel like that's incredibly frustrating, um, you know, because it's not your responsibility to have to educate and inform people about your faith, right? Especially given um, where the military has been and operating in Iraq and Afghanistan for the past 20 years or so. I mean, you would obviously hope that the military would be educating its own service members, the government would be educating its own workers um, about this. So you don't have to, so you don't have to have those sorts of conversations. Um, yeah, but, you would hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, moving, moving on, there's kind of this cliche, cliched idea in DC that happy hours are, you know, a crucial aspect of the networking scene. Uh, what's your experience as, as someone who doesn't drink, um, who still wants to socialize with your colleagues and take advantage of networking events? Yeah, so as just, you know, just to preface, as with everything else that I'm saying, I can't speak for all Muslims. Uh, we do take uh, different approaches, especially to this topic. Um, me, for me personally, I tend to avoid happy hours or other events with alcohol. Um, but I, I don't think that that's impeded me uh, or, you know, prevented me from networking in other ways. I think there's plenty of ways to network. Back when we were in the office, I, I would stop by your desk, by other people's desks, just you know, uh, talking about ongoing research, uh, what we're working on, various databases, uh, you know, outside stuff as well. Um, I think as long as you're just not facing your computer, um, as you know, researchers can sometimes do for you know, eight hours plus a day, um, as long as you're getting out, you're taking the initiative to talk to your coworkers, to people down the street, other think tanks, other other uh, folks. Um, I think that's that's the most important thing. It doesn't necessarily uh, you don't have to be going to these happy hours. Yeah, I, I definitely think that happy hours as networking events. I think that's a bit overstated, um, and I think. There are a lot of opportunities out there uh, to find and to join with communities who focus on national security issues 
Um, but you know, they may have alternative things or they may just have uh, different, different events um, that you can find online easily. Uh, but you know, this is something that we've talked about is that during COVID, uh, actually, there is kind of a proliferation of all of these online events, these online groups where you can come and you can talk about national security issues. And I feel like that's a, that's a great opportunity that people should be taking advantage of, you know, especially when we're not able to go out and, and meet people in person. Um, so I, I wanted to just cognizant of time here, I, I wanted to pivot to discuss the job hunt and networking in a bit more detail. Uh, you and I both know that the think tank space can be a difficult field to break into for young professionals. Um, what advice would you give to someone uh, looking to work in this space, both as someone who's recently gone through the application process and getting a job here, and also as someone who does hiring um, within their role? I think, uh, first off, the, the number one thing that I think of is just like, don't give up, especially if you're interested in these kind of positions. Um, I applied to probably half a dozen, maybe more CSIS internships, just, and that's just CSIS. Um, before landing a single interview. And uh, you know, when, when I did have that interview, I was competing against some strong applicants, uh, one very strong applicant by the name of uh, Mr. Seamus Daniels, uh, who ended up having taken that position. <laughs> but um, I was very fortunate. I hope, I hope to, you're not taking that personally at all. <laughs> not, not, not at all, not at all. Um, so, but I was, I was very fortunate to, to continue, uh, uh, you know, chugging along, sending those applications um, and was uh, uh, able to, to get a position. So um, I think it's just important to keep applying if this is what you're interested in, in doing um, and apply widely uh, and just don't give up. You're gonna get rejected a lot. That's, that's fine, just don't give up. I remember my first summer after, after graduating and looking for jobs. And it is tough, especially when you're sending out all of these resumes and cover letters and you're getting a steady stream of rejection emails come back, even if people, you know, from the people who actually send rejection emails. So it can be tough, um, but I think it really is about persevering. Um, you know, in, in your experience as someone who had an internship that led into their current position, do you think internships are kind of the uh, end all be all in getting positions at think tanks? in DC? Because I mean, there's also the challenge, um, there's the financial reality, right? That internships in many cases are unpaid or they don't pay a lot. Um, you know, luckily I've done my fair share of internships at DC. I always had steady support from my family that, you know, I was able to go out and do those internships. Um, but do you think that's the only way to kind of get in to find a job uh, in a think tank? No, I, I think internships are useful, um, especially if you're exploring the, the certain sector that you're interested in, think tanks in this, in this uh, uh, example. Um, but I think what's really important when I'm looking for people is um, sort of proven interest. So if they can show that they know the topic, that they've been reading the literature, um, they know the CSIS reports, the RAND, the Brookings, et cetera, that are related to the uh, whatever position it is that they're applying to, um, then I, I don't really focus too much on past internships because as you're saying, th that will uh, leave out uh, a significant number of people who, who just don't have uh, the ability, You know, whether they're across the country, um, they can't take on these kind of roles. Um, it, it, there's a huge pool of, of really strong candidates um, so as, as long as you have an interest and a demonstrated interest and you can show that and you can talk to me about it, then I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. And to that point, you know, I think it is crucial to stay engaged in the field. Um, I, my first position uh, after a series of internships was at a job in the private sector um, that didn't really focus exclusively on the foreign policy and security studies issues that I was interested in. Um, but, you know, you point out there, there are great resources, great organizations um, that you can kind of stay engaged with on the subject. So when you do have your opportunity to actually apply an interview for these positions, you're up to date on all the developments in, in your field. Um, I want to talk a little bit about networking right now, you know, outside of the happy hour kind of and contacts and talk more about engaging directly one on one. Uh, with people and reaching out to people. Uh, 
do you did you find in your experience and you know even today uh, that people are willing to uh, have these sorts of one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations with potential applicants and people who are just interested in the field? Definitely. I just you know just speaking for myself too. I've had two two phone calls with people who are interested in this space, not just necessarily CSIS, but think tanks and research more generally. Um, I know my boss, I'm scheduling conversations with him and prospective uh, applicants or, or people who are interested in the field. Um, I think generally people are, 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 are open to talking um, and it's a good idea just to reach out to people um, if you're interested in their uh, subject expertise, um, you're interested in their institution, you wanna know what they're doing day to day, um, just send an email. I think uh, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, and people are, are open to chatting during COVID. Uh, and there's also other opportunities too, aside from reaching out. You know, there's various uh, uh, virtual happy hours or meetings that you can find. Um, uh, Twitter has a bunch of these postings talking about, you know, ways people can connect. Um, a little bit of Googling really goes a long way for networking during, during COVID. Yeah, and I found that particularly during COVID, people are more willing to meet because it's not necessarily about going out and getting a coffee or having an office meeting. Uh, you can just easily set up a Zoom meeting um, with anyone to have that conversation. And I think that's that's very helpful. Um, something I would just add on is that it's not only about reaching out to the senior experts uh, whose names that everyone knows around DC who are writing everything. I think it's also important to reach out to uh, junior staff. So you have an idea. Uh, so you have an idea of, you know, what is the actual work culture at the institution that you're going to be applying to, right? And going back to your previous point about what the breakdown is between administrative positions um, and kind of the research portfolio within whatever position you're applying to is, uh, is going to be pretty important. Definitely, 100%. Um, so kind of putting on your hat as someone who's hiring now, uh, Sean, um, what types of skills do you think employers are looking for today um, in the think tank sector? So again, I'm, I want to break this up a little bit. So in general, you're going to have the same kind of uh, uh, desires from, from employers. You're going to want to have topical ex expertise. You're have, people are going to want social intelligence, flexibility, Ability to multitask, um, take in different instructions as they come in. Um, those are, you know, you can look up any of these kind of uh, uh, what employers are looking for articles, and, and you'll see very similar trends. Um, think tank specific, that's going to change depending on which think tank. Are they focused more qualitative research, quantitative, um, top, of course, topical expertise. Um, uh, so, for me, uh, I found design skills are really useful. Um, both from the people that I'm looking at and also uh, for, for myself. This is, that, that was pretty much the way that I got my foot in the door was uh, taking a class very late senior year on GIS or geographic information system, which is basically mapping software. Um, that, was, that helped me have a, a final project, uh, a nice map um, on missile proliferation. Um, was able to show that over to my you know, uh, interviewer, now, now boss. Um, and uh, that, that I think that helped out a ton. So I would highly recommend design skills, uh, Adobe, Photoshop, um, uh, other, you know, uh, whether it's, it's filmmaking or, or otherwise. I think it's really useful, especially for think tanks. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that when you're hiring for positions, you're not looking at someone who's already a ready-made expert on whatever subject you're hiring on. Right, you're looking for people who are willing to contribute to your team and who have unique skills that you know will will help the team going forward. Like GIS for you, for example, is something that helped you stand out and is great. Uh, but you know, would you agree that there's a fair expectation that there's going to be a lot of learning on the job, especially in the in the policy community? Completely. I, I don't think I don't expect people coming in knowing too much about missile defense. Um, if it's their first internship or they're still in school, uh, it is a niche topic as are other topics um, that we focus on here at CSIS and otherwise, um, there's gonna be a fair amount of learning. So being able to, that's also, you know, talking about the general expectations. 
um, being able to learn quickly, uh, efficiently, um, th those are important skills. Yeah, I, I think those intangibles are going to be really helpful. Um, but, you know, most importantly, you know, let's approach the, uh, the resume and cover letter. How do you effectively convey those intangible skills to your potential employer? How do you show them that you're the most qualified for the position? I think, uh, so speaking directly to your question, I, I think it's just important to explain how you've been uh, implementing those skills in other uh, er areas, uh, whether it's for work um, or for school. Um, and again, just like we talked about previously, that doesn't need to be past internships, um, cl school club activities as well, um, showing how, you, how you've uh, uh, been creative or how you've developed those kind of projects. I think it's really important. Um, on the topic of resumes and, and cover letters, one thing that I, I do want to bring up, though, is um, one recommendation that, that I, 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 I like seeing people have is uh, telling me how they would add value to uh, my organization to the Missile Defense Project. Um, I think typically a lot of people, when they're writing their cover letters, they'll talk about how, uh, how much this internship would help them. Um, I think that's great. Um, I do want to help my interns, but I also want to know how they can help me, uh, speaking selfishly, of course, but um, it, it's something to hit on. And I think other other folks generally, uh, at least as far as I'm aware, would, would, would agree. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree with with everything that you said there. Um, let's move on to uh, to a few questions in the chat that we have. Um, feel free. Uh, everyone attending to shoot a question into the Q&A um, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Uh, but we'll kick it off with this one. Um, what is one thing that people can do to improve DEI in their own policy community? Uh, Sean, do you wanna take a stab at that uh, and then I'll weigh in? Sure, so one thing that we can do to improve. Um, I think, of course, I'm going to turn back to what CSIS is doing, what the ISC program is doing. Um, I think opening up spaces uh, for people is, is, is important, making sure that you're making a commitment um, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it's a conscious effort, too. Um, we've been, we have, uh, uh, as, as part of this initiative, um, a uh, writing series from people with underrepresented uh, uh, communities. Um, who are writing on issues of national security and also of race. Um, I think that's that's a great space. We have this series um, talking about people's experiences. Um, I, I, I think that, I hope that that, that will be useful. Um, and we also have, we're, we're building a advisory board um, just to overlook some of the, the processes. Um, this is a bit separate, but also transparency is, is important. Uh, making sure that you are aware of uh, and you are telling folks um, who you're bringing in, right? If it's uh, if you're just bringing in um, white males, as, as uh, typically uh, dominates the these spaces, um, then that's something you know. As as transparency comes in, then you'll be able to reflect on that and and perhaps uh, reach out to some speakers who who aren't. Um, so often in, invited to these places. Yeah, I think you made a number of great points there, Sean. Um, I think, you know, when we're approaching how to improve DEI in your own policy community, obviously it depends on where you are within your community and the amount of impact that you can have. Um, but I think everyone has the ability to promote those issues and promote creating a more diverse and uh, welcoming workspace. And I think that's true from, you know, the highest levels of the bosses in the rooms down to, down to, you know, even an intern in that space. And, you know, it starts off by having these conversations uh, within your department, within your community about the steps that you can take. Um, but Shauna, I think you gave a number of great examples, right? Especially when we're talking about organizing events, organizing panels, you know, we've all seen our fair share of panels that have just a bunch of white males uh, that dominate the space and they're kind of the same voices that are at every single event. Uh, people really need to work on bringing, uh, merging diverse voices and promoting them in the field. 
uh, again, this comes back to hiring also. And Sean, I love that you mentioned transparency. And I think transparency is very important in making sure that you know, you're know you reviewing, uh, you're, you're extending those opportunities, you're promoting uh, the positions that you're hiring for to you know, diverse communities, to HBCUs uh, as you're hiring out there. Um, and reviewing the numbers and the resumes that you're actually uh, that you're actually getting. Um, let's see if there are any other questions in the chat. Um, I don't see any, so feel free to uh, to jump in. Uh, Sean, um, to ask you a question, what is one piece of advice that you wish uh, that you wish you had uh, heard? as you were going into this hiring process, as you were applying to, to all of these jobs? I think the, the first one thing that comes in mind is, is a really basic piece of advice, but one that I probably didn't do as well as, as I should have, um, is just really polish up those writing samples. Um, if you're studying international relations, if you're studying political science or you know wh whatever it is, um, and you're interested in this space, uh, you should already have written um, some some longer pieces. It doesn't have to be too long, five plus pages typically um, for, for your classes, right? And so if you're able to look back at those classes, look back at the results um, and make it clean so that way you can forward it to prospective employers um, for either internships or for entry level positions, I think that's really important. Um, I had uh, a fair amount of papers uh, after graduating, um, but I wasn't especially proud of them. Um, and I, I took a little bit too much time um, before going back and cleaning them up uh, to, to, to use as writing samples. So very basic piece of advice, but, and it's something that people say a lot, but just something that I wanna uh, emphasize. Yeah, and I think even for people who don't necessarily have those writing samples from from school, from college, uh, I think there are other avenues to create those writing samples. Um, there are a number of online outlets that welcome kind of emerging voices in the field. That's something that people should should look into, um, and a number of fellowships that aim to promote uh, people's work, even if they're not kind of in this public think tank space. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one more thing that I just wanted to talk about on, on that on that point uh, before you raise up the, the next question, but is, is that there's there's so many different outlets that you can pitch to um, in this space. You know, we focus on defense issues, but um, so so we're more familiar with War on the Rocks, Defense One, Defense News, all these places with Defense in the Title or something. Um, those are all great outlets that you can be pitching to that you can work with someone, whether it's a professor or a think tank or um, anyone really, if you have an idea, um, uh, I, I think that's also what, what you're saying is outside of the classroom. I, I just wanted to hit on that point again. Um, that's a great point. Yeah. And something else, um, especially when I'm talking to younger people who are looking to join the field, uh, I think, you know, there is an expectation that you have to kind of take the internship route to end up getting a job in a think tank. And I would just encourage people to look at other options that are out there especially when we come back to the you know, financial reality of it in that interns are, are unpaid and it can be a very tough route and a very long wait sometimes until you get that full-time position. I would just encourage people to uh, not be afraid to look to alternatives, jobs in the private sector um, that you can then use as kind of that launching pad to have that stability uh, to find a job in the think tank space, um, which I think is helpful. And we have another question, um, speaking more to Sean and your GIS uh, expertise, uh, specialty skills like GIS and design can be game changers, but it depends a lot on the hiring manager knowing the value and the specifics of the job. How did you strategize on highlighting those skills when you were job seeking? That's a great question. I, I think being able to have, again, I was talking about the writing portfolio, I was probably speaking a little bit too specifically. Having any kind of portfolio, whether it's writing or if it's design as well, is, is important. So what I had at the end of that class was um, a, a pretty well-detailed map that I had worked on with two other classmates. Um, uh, I, I believe it was you know, detailing uh, 
Chinese missile ranges, uh, off, you know, and, and off off the coast or something. Um, and it was, it, I, I was able to share it with uh, my my interviewer, um, and being able to have some kind of product like that that you can share um, is is really helpful. Um, whether it's GIS or you know what I was talking about earlier with Photoshop or if it's Tableau, all these other uh, more specific um, uh, design products. Um, and of course, I'm focusing on design because that's what I've, I've, I've been talking about, but there are other uh, uh, products, for example, you know, even just Excel, just being able to prove that you have knowledge of Excel as you know, Shane that's working on all these budget pieces is, is well aware of the importance of that. Yeah, and you know, I think this goes back to the question of the uh, the resume and the cover letter, uh, and really about highlighting your strengths and your key assets here, right? Because you want to show off how great of a candidate you are and why you are the most qualified candidate for that position. So make sure that if you're sending in uh, your resume, make sure that there are hyperlinks to those pieces that you're proud about, whether it's a writing sample, whether it's mapping, whether it's you know talking about a data set that you've created, you wanna flag those for the person who is reviewing the resume and make sure that it's going to catch their eye. I think that's very important um, because, you know, Hiring managers can be going through hundreds of resumes, and so they want to see something that stands out and distinguishes you as a candidate. And don't be afraid to bring that up uh, in your cover letter and in, a, and in an interview to show how it's relevant to the job and that it's an asset that your potential employer could really, it could really benefit their work. Um, we have one other question right now. Please feel free to keep them coming. Um, what is the impact and outcome of a more inclusive and equitable participation from all levels of society in the formation of national security and foreign policies? And how will these eventually affect them in their day-to-day -day livelihood? Do you want to kick that off? Do you want to take a stab at that, Sean? Sure. No, it's a big question. It's a, it's a very higher level question, yes. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's an important question. I think whether you're talking about the national security field or otherwise, um, having more voices is just is, is good for a number of reasons. You're going to be avoiding uh, the, the perils of groupthink. You're going to have different perspectives uh, on, on whatever topic it is that you're studying or that you're working in. Um, uh, in, in general, there's, there's a huge number of, of uh, cognitive failures that comes with just having um, a single group of people from similar backgrounds um, focus on your topic. So diversifying those voices is really important. Um, there's also, uh, I can, you know, we can talk about representation and basically inviting other communities um, through, uh, through, through, through seeing people in those positions, um, uh, positions that, that they would themselves be interested in and, and not knowing that that is an option for them. Um, so just in general, just increasing the opportunity for, for people um, and raising awareness in that sense. Um, going back to my, my earlier story about the army uh, recruiter coming in uh, and you know having a, a false belief um, with regard to Islamic uh, practices and beliefs. Um, I think if he had been challenged by uh, a Muslim earlier, um, he hopefully would not have been uh, spreading that 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 false message, um, and it wouldn't have been spread to however many high schools he had been to. Um, so that is a dangerous message, um, and it's something that. Could have been um, uh, hit on earlier had he been exposed to those uh, those other voices. Um, so uh, diversity, a ton of other reasons that I'm not addressing, but uh, those are just a few. I, I really love that you hit on the, the dangers of groupthink, um, especially in the national security field, which you know, as as we talked about, there is kind of this idea that there's this establishment way of thinking, you know, that's been predominantly created by, by white males. But, you know, a lot of times, especially in our fields, in the missile defense field and the defense budget field, we keep hearing the same ideas coming around. Um, and in many cases, they're not the, they're not the best ideas. Um, you have these bad ideas circulating about ways to improve missile defense systems, uh, ways to get more out of the defense budget, and it's the same old thing. Uh, that's not actually improving national security policy uh, and foreign policy. Uh, so that's, you know, at that higher level, 
Um, that is the benefit of elevating diverse voices and making sure that you have people coming in with innovative ways to create new solutions to the NatSec challenges that we're facing. I mean, we can point to any number of, you know, Harvard Business Review studies and articles on the importance of having a diverse workforce um, in the private sector, but that also extends, uh, you know, directly into the national security workforce also. Okay. Let me see if there are any other questions here. All right, what are steps that think tanks are doing to diversify the references and resources they utilize in their writing and research and not just in their employment? Uh, how are think tanks in defense elevating diverse voices in this way? Well, I'll, I'll kick off answering this one um, because, you know, this is important to me. Uh, within the International Security Program at CSIS, we have a uh, publication series on Defense 360. Uh, you can find it at uh, defense360.csis.org called Represent. Um, and the whole point is to elevate diverse voices and give them the platform to present their analysis and talk about their experiences in the NASAC field. And so this is you know, important to me that we're able to elevate diverse voices um, um, in this way. And this is only uh, you know, one aspect of the steps that the International Security Program at CSIS uh, is taking to do this. Um, Sean, did you have uh, anything to add there? I think so with the question as uh, regarding what diversifying resources, um, that's an interesting question. It's not something that I've considered too much. Um, I, I think we're still going to be looking at generally the, the same kind of resources that we have been. Um, it's going to be uh, academic papers. It's going to be other, other think tankers, journalists on the ground. Um, but while we're doing that, what what should be happening is, is those fields as well are diversifying, academia, diversifying journalism, uh, looking to, to other communities. So we're, we're hoping that uh, as those processes happen, um, that uh, as, and as we reform our own institutions, that we will be able to bring in those voices um, uh, later on as well. Yeah, and we can only speak to what CSIS is doing, but I would hope that other think tanks would follow our lead in creating publication series like Represent. Um, so please do feel free to check it out uh, again on Defense 360. And if you would like to submit a pitch, um, we'll definitely get back to you. Sean, it looks like those are all of the questions today. Um, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for joining me today for this conversation. I think it was incredibly helpful. Um, and, you know, it was also just lovely to see you again. Thanks, Jim. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in. Um, please be sure to look out for the next event in the, uh, in the Opening Doors series. Thank you for joining this morning. Bye-bye.